I'm going to uh, turn this over to Chris Betts, who has been working with the EDM Council and giving us some uh, guidance and consultation on blockchain, which is an area of expertise for Chris uh, for the last several years. And Chris and I are going to partner on this presentation. So Chris, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. I'm actually in South Carolina with a terrible bandwidth at the moment, so uh, forgive me for any latency. Uh, generally, when I start off these uh, talks and presentations, I ask the audience how many have been involved or are tracking blockchain. And you know, since I can't be there with you, unfortunately, uh, maybe uh, a, a quick show of hands just to show my, my colleagues how many of you out there have been involved or are in, currently involved or are planning on being involved in a blockchain initiative at your firms? A couple of people. A couple of people. Okay, very good. The reason I ask that question is it's, uh, it's level setting. As, we, as uh, somebody who's been at this in the blockchain world for a little while, um, you know, sometimes we, we uh, are, are wrapped up in all the hype and uh, forget uh, that there are still, there's still a lot of ground to cover as far as educating, familiarizing, uh, and introducing folks to blockchain and what it's all about. Um, so today, uh, David, if you could march to the next slide. Okay, so, uh, you know, basically what I'll do is I'll review who's involved uh, with a focus on financial services. Um, why is this important? What are the benefits of blockchain and why is everybody uh, beginning to spend uh, uh, an extraordinary amount of money in the domain? Um, a little bit about how it works from a very high level. It's technically complex set of technologies. It's not just one technology, uh, although a lot of people like to, uh, uh, like to describe it as such. And then uh, the thing that is really going to be interesting is uh, watching David explain exactly how this is going to be used uh, using FIBO with a uh, blockchain construct and the importance of building uh, FIBO into actual financial contracts. Uh, next slide, David. So let's talk about who's involved. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, virtually everybody in financial services these days, particularly the banks and broker dealers, uh, are very much invested from a, uh, from a, you know, an exploration and investment point of view within blockchain. Within the EDM Council, just as an indicative uh, data point, uh, somewhere on the order of 90% of the council board of directors in the organization are involved, and about 60% of the 200 firms are involved in some way, shape, or form. So most of these uh, initiatives now are in the ex exploration phase. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But in a matter of, I would say, 12 to 14 months, the, the narrative has completely swapped out of Bitcoin. There's a bunch of lunatic people out there trying to take over the world with, uh, with a cryptographic chaotic uh, currency to blockchain being the foundation of the next generation of financial infrastructure uh, with organizations like DTCC very, very actively involved. We can go to the next slide. So first, let's talk about the platforms. Um, there are many platforms out there, some uh, focusing on specific industries. Some are more open than others. Some are better funded than others. Um, but you can see from the uh, diversity, uh, several of them are well past their Series A fundings, have very uh, high-level blue chip partnerships. Uh, Digital Asset Holdings, for instance, has an investment from DTCC. Chain has an investment from NASDAQ. Uh, Ripple is uh, all over the place. Blockstream has folks like uh, Reed, uh, Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn as key investors. So 
a lot of interest from a very broad diversity of, of organizations and investors. Uh, from an investment point of view, we also see Wall Street very well represented. Uh, well over a billion dollars worth of venture capital has gone into these companies in the last couple of years. The switch is occurring right now out of Bitcoin-oriented investments into blockchain data fabric investments. Um, many of these organizations, many Wall Street organizations, are using partnerships and consortia-driven initiatives to orient themselves, uh, uh, dial up proofs of concept, and figure and have a, a, a forum to work together uh, in order to be able to build these platforms out. Now, blockchain by definition is a network, which we'll go into in a little bit, but no blockchain can exist with one node. You have to have nodes in cooperation amongst industry partners, which uh, is driving not only a standards collaboration through organizations like EDM and FIBO, but it's also uh, driving uh, deliberate development initiatives with, uh, with a lot of different uh, counterparties. Um, the proofs of concept that we see in financial services today are across asset classes and across audiences. In other words, uh, we see retail-based applications, institutional-based applications going across uh, options, derivatives, bonds, syndicated loans, commercial paper. So uh, if I was to tell you nine months ago that uh, the blue chip banks, the top 20 banks would be uh, working together on collaborating and working on proofs of concept across you know, 15, 20 different asset classes, I would have told you you were insane. But it gives you an idea of how rapidly the development in this space is progressing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, the consortia-driven initiatives are uh, becoming a foundational component, not only in financial services, but, the, but other industries as well. The most advanced is one called R3. R3CEV is its, uh, its, its official company name, and they run a group called the Distributed Ledger Group. Um, it's a paid membership model. Each member pays to be a part of this consortia. They dedicate resources. They dedicate code and they dedicate uh, 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 dollars to make this consortia successful. Um, within a year, this consortia has attracted over 46 global institutions and they're already launching proofs of, of concept. Uh, last week, they re, uh, launched Corda, their own blockchain fabric, and they also have uh, partnered and are beginning to partner with the buy side as well as the regulators as part of their as part of their consortium initiative. So this is a very, very powerful example of what kind of collaboration is happening to make these blockchain uh, blockchain implementations happen. Next slide. Um, outside of the semantic uh, graph uh, uh, standard space, um, at there are actual standards being developed along the lines for these blockchain platforms. Um, the most notable is Hyperledger. It was officially launched in January. There are over 300 members to the organization today. Ethereum uh, has a community of very proactive developers. Its tenor is more like the Bitcoin community, but it's a completely open platform with its own Turing complete strip scripting language to develop smart contracts, uh, as well as uh, support use cases, not just industry-based, but across industries for things like identity, predictive analytics, uh, specific cross-industry uh, cross use cases that impact everybody. Um, so going through that, you know, uh, obviously, uh, next slide, David. Um, that is attracting a considerable amount of regulatory interest. And I would say in the last month, the surprising thing is uh, the regulators are starting to uh, make announcements, uh, pronounce, pr pronouncements along the lines of, we want this kind of innovation in the ecosystem. We want to treat blockchain development and innovation like the internet innovation that we saw back in the early 90s. Uh, in a nutshell, the posture across the regulatory community 
seems to be uh, migrating towards a first do no harm type of uh, scenario, which is really fantastic. We've seen the CFTC uh, very actively involved, U.S. Treasury, uh, the Fed is, and many other central banks are very, very actively working with the community, uh, trying to gain knowledge, understanding, and understand the implications of the technology. But uh, from a larger picture point of view, what many of these uh, regulators realize is that there are significant savings in cost, in cost and, and, uh, and time, but there are also many, many different opportunities for regulators to proactively collaborate and work on these platforms because it reduces regulatory overhead, regulatory costs, and, it eva and uh, uh, enables um, regulatory surveillance where regulatory surveillance wasn't necessarily possible without an extraordinary amount of expense before. Next slide, David. So uh, what's got everybody's attention? What are the key factors here that are attracting so many different uh, organizations to, to the technology? What's driving the hype? So next slide, David. So the potential benefits, and I say potential because the only production blockchain platform out today uh, with any kind of scale is still Bitcoin. There's a lot of emerging uh, things and there's a lot of promise in these technologies, but all the proofs of concept that we see being launched now are early stage, rapidly evolving, and most seem to consider that these, uh, these benefits that I highlight here will be delivered late 2016, beginning in 2017. So running down the checklist really quickly, um, first, better security because uh, blockchain enables cryptographic identity alongside of the assets and uh, uh, in the rights on the blockchain, all of the data within that fabric is cryptographically hashed. So very, very robust uh, uh, security from an encryption point of view is baked into the fabric of, of most blockchains. Um, from uh, consensus transaction validation and verification, basically it's network-driven reconciliation of transactions using algorithms. There are many, many different consul uh, consensus protocols, uh, Byzantine fault tolerance, proof of work, proof of stake, many more on the way. Uh, and this is a very rapidly evolving end of the blockchain, but basically what it allows is a network of nodes to work together to verify transactions, uh, virtually eliminating reconciliation in the transaction chain. Uh, blockchains enable what are called smart contracts. Basically, this is the dematerialization of assets as we know it today. Stock certificates, contracts, titles, leases, uh, ad infinitum can be replicated using code on a blockchain, stored on a blockchain, and then, uh, and then distributed throughout a network so that there's one version of the truth. Um, one version of the truth is the universal uh, data source reference. In other words, basically what you have is a centrally accessible data fabric that's distributed throughout a network of nodes. So basically everybody has a virtual DTCC in the case of financial services sitting in the middle of their business network and that enables peer-to-peer -peer transactions going across with no intermediary hops. Uh, obviously very, very powerful. Um, when you are building blockchains, you, you find out very rapidly that you're really enabling very rich data sets because audit trails, histories, uh, immutable proofs of transactions are baked into the blockchain as well as the code for the smart contract. So you, not only do you have the asset, but you also have the, the, the changes in states of the asset that you can work with, but also the transaction histories that, are, uh, that have hit that asset for the life of that, for, for the full life cycle of that asset. Very, very powerful stuff. And when I refer to asset, I'm not only talking about assets like the ones I was referring to before, but identity is an asset and data is an asset. So there's uh, reference data is an asset. So there are, you know, you can, you can define your asset virtually any way you can, but you can track the value of it moving up and down uh, very, uh, very, very closely. Uh, it's very, very transparent. 
Um, from, a, uh, from a protection point of view, um, because all of the information is stored on a network as opposed to in one centralized data store, uh, the distributed records are very, uh, uh, makes for a very robust, uh, a very robust and hack-proof uh, data fabric. You're not giving uh, you're not giving interlopers one target to go after to bring down an entire infrastructure. They'd have to bring down all nodes in the network, corrupt all nodes in the network, before the network uh, would be would, would suffer any data loss. Uh, so all the data is replicated, automatically backed up, and automatically distributed as part of the uh, as part of the protocols. Um, transparent real time reporting. Uh, you can enable uh, robust permissioning frameworks that basically allow anybody to read data uh, and take special permission to write data within this fabric. And faster settlement, I alluded to it before, blockchain allows a network of peers to transact directly through the network. Um, so no intermediaries involved. If, uh, if JP Morgan wants to do a swap with Wells, they can do it directly amongst themselves and then write that to uh, a blockchain where all their counterparties, regulators, and anybody else, any other interested parties who need to know, can know about that transaction if they are uh, if they're uh, allowed. So very quickly, next slide, David. Let's talk about what is a blockchain. What are the key components, the key parts? David, next slide. Um, the key parts, uh, the key components, and again, this is high level. Uh, it does get very complex very quickly. Uh, first, you have a network of nodes that are interconnected, uh, usually using uh, standard internet protocols. Uh, member networks, which we'll explain in a moment, can have different characteristics and different permissioning frameworks based on what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. The nodes within the uh, blockchain carry the blockchain distributed ledger itself. Uh, these are linked blocks of data that represent a chain of transactions uh, going back since the beginning of time, uh, since the blockchain itself was spun up. Within the blocks, uh, within, our, uh, within those blocks are transactions. Those transactions uh, are comprised of sender receiver uh, and uh, uh, at the transaction or code itself. Um, all that uh, information is only accessible via an encrypted key, uh, which protects the information. And again, all those transaction blocks are, uh, are, uh, are, are blocked and linked together into an immutable record of the transaction history. Next slide, David. Um, from a logical architecture point of view, um, we're all used to kind of top of the stack, bottom of the stack. So at the top of the stack, you have uh, existing applications today and new applications that are blockchain enabled or necessary for a blockchain. Um, you have, for instance, uh, wallets, which manage keys to transactions and keys to identity. Very important in the fabric at the top of the application stack. Um, those are all inter interconnected uh, through APIs and, A uh, uh, and SDKs down to the distributed ledger fabric. So everything below the APIs and SDKs is the blockchain fabric. Um, three key components, uh, I won't go into them all, but uh, rights management, which basically says who can be a node on the network, who can participate, who can read, who can write. Uh, it uh, it, it uh, provides a very robust permissioning framework for participation. The blockchain itself is the peer-to-peer -peer protocol between nodes transfer uh, back and forth of data, fault tolerance, uh, the consensus algorithms that I mentioned earlier, the actual distributed ledger itself, and then the storage mechanism that it's used. You can use uh, virtually any storage mechanism that you like. Uh, we're looking at uh, different organizations now that are using, uh, for instance, uh, graph storage, uh, as well as uh, other, diff other different uh, storage frameworks. Um, the smart contracts, uh, are very interesting. We'll go into a little bit more of that, uh, and that will be part of David's uh, part, of the, part of the show. Um, smart contracts are encapsulated in virtual machines and containers. Uh, they, are, uh, they include things like provenance, digital notary, 
they uh, contain also uh, what are called oracles, which are calls out to third-party data sources uh, in addition to the transaction and events that interact with the smart contract. And those are all uh, 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 built into the blockchain and the code is distributed on the blockchain via registry services. Uh, next slide, David. There are many different uh, blockchain types and it seems like there are more emerging that you can enable with that blockchain stack. Um, this is a very, very high level uh, decision tree. Uh, as many people are struggling, you know, why would you use a blockchain as opposed to a distributed database or some other type of uh, solution? Well, you know, the, the decision tree is actually kind of simple. Um, you know, how many ledger copies are needed? Well, if you are one organization and you only need one internal ledger, well, uh, you just can use a regular database for that kind of fabric. So give Oracle a call. If you need many different ledgers and you need many different counterparties to use and access that, then you start running into, okay, how do we manage distribution? How do we control distribution? And how do we share data back and forth? Now, um, this kind of leads to the branching of the different blockchain fabrics that we've seen before. So if you have a very closed owner group, uh, for instance, today's clearing networks uh, are similar to this where you have basic permission private shared distributed ledgers. Um, this is a perfect application for that type of thing where you're not going to bring any counterparties in, but you only keep it a very, very tightly closed uh, uh, stack for a specific small group of members. Um, if you want anybody to have access to that data and you want to enable enterprise applications, retail applications, uh, then you need to figure out a way to permission it for the public component, but either maintain control of it from a trust point of view or distribute trust to all the nodes. Uh, most of the blockchains being developed a la Wall Street today are permissioned public shared ledgers. They're federated, but they're accessible uh, via different permissioned public entities. So for instance, Corda, which is what R3 just uh, launched, actually enables regulators to participate in the network by having their own special type of node on the network. Um, they're not given any right access to those nodes, but they can read uh, a, a certain level of data uh, for their own regulatory reporting purposes. And then on the bottom, you know, where you don't have anybody who you can trust, but you want to maintain a public posture, this is a Bitcoin blockchain type of fabric where everybody and anybody and everybody can join, anybody can be a node, and through uh, proof, proof of work, which is algorithmic, uh, algorithmic consensus, uh, an algorithmic consensus mechanism. Anybody can verify and mine transactions, and they are uh, they they monetize that through uh, through the mining process, where they're given Bitcoin awards for solving uh, cryptographic uh, problems proofs. Next slide, David. Um, so uh, high level transaction flow, uh, transactions created either somewhere on the application stack. It can actually be a transaction created by a smart contract based on an event. Uh, that transaction, it hits a node on the network. Uh, it is validated and grouped uh, with uh, several other nodes in block creation. Um, the uh, rest of the network at that point needs to, uh, based on the consensus rules, verify and validate that transaction. And then once the transaction is validated by the network, it is uh, written to the blockchain and that copy uh, and a new copy of the blockchain is issued to, uh, to the network. Next slide, David. Uh, I believe this is my, uh, my, my last slide. Um, so there's a lot of talk about things like smart contracts. Now, smart contracts are code uh, used, used, generally speaking, with Turing complete programming languages. For instance, Ethereum has a programming language called Solidity uh, where you can stand up an instance of a contract. Uh, you can code it and then write it into an Ethereum blockchain. 
The contract is built so that transactions can change the state and value of that contract, and that contract can also generate additional transactions and events based on the code in that contract. All audited, all replicated throughout the ledger. So uh, when you think about uh, the number of applications and use cases for this type of technology, it's virtually limitless, and that's why there's so much hype. But uh, as you can see by, through, the, uh, the, through the, uh, uh, the thing there, uh, the, the slide, uh, basically you can replicate contractual terms through code. Uh, the contract is created and brought onto the ledger. Uh, events and updates can, uh, uh, can uh, again, impact the transaction and the state of the, uh, of the contract. You can execute transfer of that asset directly on blockchain. So for instance, stock certificates written in a smart contract format can change ownership virtually in a pure dematerialized way uh, with instantaneous transfer, instantaneous value transfer, and instantaneous audit trails on a blockchain. So T plus zero, uh, is everybody ready? Um, again, instantaneous clearing and settlement, and then off-chain physical assets uh, are, can be interlinked through different design patterns. So, for instance, if you have an MRI uh, being uh, done on a Philips, uh, a, a, a Philips Healthcare MRI machine, that machine can actually take that MRI data, write it to a blockchain, and there's proof of pr and providence of that transaction throughout so that uh, you know, several different doctors can collaborate using that same, uh, that same, for instance, MRI image. Um, now, in the case of financial services, what got me really excited was the discovery of FIBO. FIBO, uh, as, as you, you already know, um, you know, represents financial contracts and provides a standard semantic ontology that can be used and power these smart contracts written to these blockchain fabrics. Very, very powerful metaphor. And uh, David, uh, why don't you take it from here? Uh, David can show you actual use cases on how it all comes together. David, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chris. And um, we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to just sum this up and wrap it up very quickly. I think that blockchain really is a very big thing. It turns the internet into a distributed ledger where those with the right to know can have access. That's a huge thing. And even larger than that, with the advent of Ethereum, it turns the internet into a huge, huge distributed computer. There are opportunities and implications for, uh, from blockchain that we haven't even considered um, thinking through the possibilities. It almost scares me when I think of when we apply uh, machine learning and cognitive computing capabilities to the peer-to-peer -peer computing nodes running on Ethereum. Uh, we're really at the door of, of Skynet. It, it really is something, uh, at one level, uh, huge, huge opportunities. At another level, something very scary we have to really be very careful about uh, as we roll this out. But what are the implications for FIBO? So the big, big gap within the whole blockchain initiative is they're moving very quickly and they're not thinking about standards yet. And so FIBO has an opportunity to fill a huge gap so that we don't kick off this whole new world of blockchain opportunities, creating yet more and more silos, which would be a bad thing. So there is discussion among uh, ourselves, uh, the EDM Council and the R3 uh, uh, initiative, and we'll be talking with the Hyperledger folks, and we've had some conversations with some of the companies involved with Ethereum, Consensus, for example, and they're looking at derivatives as use cases using interest rate swaps, and we would like to get them on board with uh, the path forward using FIBO. So very quickly, uh, I covered this use case where we have loan, securitiz loan origination and securitization cuts across many different silos. 
but fast forwarding it to having, if FIBO were able to be a pervasive standard over the blockchain, then we would have borrowers that would have their assets and their debts on what would be called a permissioned public shared ledger, where the borrower, us, the individual, would have control of our, over our data. That's part of the um, data, uh, personal data locker initiative, the personal data ecosystem initiative, where we would then provide access through handing over a public key to the loan originator, who could also take a look at if we're, bar if we're borrowing money for uh, a home purchase or a, a home equity line, uh, the uh, title of the property would be uh, on an unpermissioned uh, public shared ledger versus a permissioned one. Unpermissioned is totally open. Anyone can have access to it. The actual originator then, as they're originating the loan, would have more of a private shared ledger where all the loans would be pooled together as they are cutting across the securitization process into tranches. That would be on a permissioned private shared ledger. Investors would be able to also create another permissioned private shared ledger that they would then have access to the tranches, ultimately being able to get access to the borrowers to detect risk, the risk of the loan. That was something that had we had this capability where we would have uh, a common standard through FIBO where all of this information would be transparent and accessible, the risks of the global financial crisis would have been dramatically minimized. So we have some real opportunities. So where FIBO supports the, uh, the notion of contracts and we've gone through how we would look at derivatives, so I'm going to jump through this slide. Here's where the next, I think, very cool opportunity is, is where today where we have XML representing many of the standards with XML schema, XML payloads, we fast forward over to FIBO where we can use a JSON-LD extraction of the ontology. So we have common terminology, Within the ontology, we have common terminology for data at rest. We have common terminology for data in motion. FIBO makes all of this possible. So that, I think, is a really, really big thing where we no longer have this Tower of Babel. So moving forward, FIBO then can be used with the uh, in creation of these smart contracts because, again, FIBO is based on the notion of the semantics of the contract, we'll be able to see standards in this example for uh, derivatives that could run over a blockchain, uh, eliminating the intermediary. So there's a whole new notion of disintermediation. The next opportunity for FIBO, which I think is another really big thing, is in regulatory reporting over the blockchain. So we have a common use case that Lynn Callahan talked about yesterday for loan origination called HUMDA for the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act reporting, where we get different reports from different siloed organizations and someone has to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and assemble it all and make sure it's curated and correct and move it on uh, on a quarterly and annual basis to the uh, CFPB to validate the, uh, the reports. Well, if we use blockchain and FIBO, uh, what we will be able to have is that each line of business will write using FIBO terminology over JSON-LD payloads to a blockchain. So the blockchain would have a pointer back to the actual data in the legacy systems, which would be mapped through R2RML that would be captured on the blockchain. Uh, and FIBO would again make sure we have this common terminology so that at the end of the day, we can aggregate all these different reports from different legacy systems that write to a common terminology using FIBO on the blockchain where the regulators can look at this and do an automatic audit 
that has already been curated through FIBO so that the data would be classified to be correct or incorrect. If it's not correct, it doesn't get on the blockchain. Long story short is that we have an opportunity here to solve that major problem that companies have with regulatory reporting where we get dinged with MRAs because we're off. This will be an automated way of having a fully consistent, high quality regulatory reporting. So I think this is really a, a huge opportunity for FIBO where FIBO can provide these standards. So with that, thank you very much for your patience during these uh, presentations.